the first people to leave Europe and attempt to settle in North America were the French. They departed in 1604, a group of adventurers, only men, no women or families. And they established the first settlement at Port Royal, Nova Scotia. But then it was called Acadia. We see that most of these early French adventurers came from the portion of France which is known as the center western part of France. Nova Scotia, which resembles a large number seven, at the southwestern part of it you'll see Port Royal. That settlement was established 16 years before the pilgrims landed in Plymouth. And so it's interesting to appreciate the rivalry that developed between the pilgrims who were the, the uh, Protestant had been kicked out of England seeking to establish a new place to practice their religion in comparison to the Acadians who were Catholic and were not going over there for religious reasons. They were going over there to establish a new colony. The area where they first settled was called the Minas Basin. It's still a beautiful area right on the Bay of Fundy. And we know that by 1613, Port Royal was an established fort where uh, already the uh, pilgrims who were going to settle five years after this were looking toward this territory as a threat to their establishing a colony in what they called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. These early settlers would be depicted sort of as a French-Canadian fur trapper in the uh, 1600s. And uh, it cannot be overestimated the importance of their connection to the native people at this time. And the largest native tribe in the area were called the Mi'kmaq. And they immediately bonded with the Acadians and taught the Acadians their ways, which they had experienced over the millennium. They taught them rather than to try to form, uh, it would be better to reclaim lands from the sea to this Abwato system. And uh, in fact, the chief Mermento even converted to Catholicism to show his solidarity with the Acadians. And many Acadians intermarried with the Mi'kmaq. This is a stark contrast to what happened with the pilgrims who for many, many uh, decades were in warfare with the natives and it caused them to have a much more difficult time in settling in North America. For approximately until 1713, the colony went back and forth between the French, the English, the French, and the English. And finally in 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht ceded the colony to England forever. The name was changed to Nova Scotia, and good Queen Anne, who was then the Queen of England, was very kind to the Acadians. She granted to them a dispensation from converting to Protestantism. They could maintain the Catholicism and also maintain property ownership. And she gave them 12 months to decide if they wanted to remain in the colony and become British subjects or deport and move to other places. Well, most Acadians decided to remain. And they were often asked to take oaths of loyalty to the British. And the Acadians felt they had to maintain this neutrality for fear that if they became full British subjects, the Native Americans would uh, extract revenge against them. And they were also fearful they would be caused to fight in future wars against their cousins, the French. So they always demurred or declined to take this oath of fidelity to the King of England. Finally, in 1730, uh, there was a British officer named Shirley who was able to extract what was called a conditional oath of neutrality, allowing the Acadians to remain, be, be, become British subjects, but not take the full oath, allowing them to maintain 
their religion and being free to serve in any future wars. That led to the golden years of Akkadi, where they really prospered. Their population doubled every 20 years. And although they had their brushes with the British, it wasn't until this man, British officer Charles Lawrence, who was Lieutenant Governor, decided with the cooperation of the Governor Shirley of Boston to concoct a scheme to deport all of the Acadians and take their precious and rich lands. It's important to note that the pressure came not from London, it came from Boston. In summary, it was the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the pilgrims who carried out the deportation of the Acadians. We see John Winslow, a colonel from Boston, marching his troops into Grand Pre, the largest Acadian village, and secretly requiring all men and boys above the age of 10 to report to the village church at 3 p.m. on September 5th. And the doors were locked and the order was read to them that they were to be deported and all of their possessions forfeited to the King of England. John Winslow's great-grandfather was one of the leaders of the first pilgrim expedition to drop anchor in Plymouth Harbor. There were approximately 18,000 Acadians and it's estimated between one-third and one-half perished during this horrendous scene of terror and destruction. We know from various senses the Acadians had over 200,000 head of livestock. Those animals were later captured and brought and sold to try to recoup the expenses that the British incurred by shipping the Acadians off to the British colonies in various expeditions all the way down as far south as Savannah, Georgia. It was their hope that by dispersing the Acadians throughout the British colonies that eventually their descendants would abandon their Acadian identity and become good British subjects. They were mistaken. Their efforts at ethnic cleansing, at genocide, failed. The Acadians had developed their own ethnicity. They had thought of themselves as people who had inherent rights in sovereignty. They believed no government could take away their inherent sovereignty and freedoms. If that sounds familiar, it should ring true because that was the inspiration for the American Revolution, which took place just a decade later. The deportations are very complicated to explain. Suffice it to say, one-third were deported to the British colonies. One-third escaped. Led by Beausoleil Broussard, they had a valiant resistance for at least five years where they fought with their French brethren in Quebec. And sadly, one-third to one-half perished. Indeed, these deportations went on for seven years. In 1758, there were three ships bringing 875 Acadians, repatriating back to France. The three ships sank, all Acadians aboard drowned. Those Acadians who managed to escape ultimately surrendered after Quebec surrendered and they were placed on George's Island, a small island in Halifax Harbor, where approximately 1,000 to 1,500 Acadians remained for four years. Only the young men were allowed to leave and allowed to go work on their farms, which the British had confiscated. But they managed to earn enough money 
that finally when the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, they were able to charter a boat and 202 Acadians were the first to set sail and went to first the French West Indies and then ultimately dropped anchor in the port of New Orleans in February of 1765. Here we have Acadians from Maryland, the second largest group that came in two boats came from Maryland to join the first group led by Beausoleil Broussard, who had been given terrific help by the Louisiana colony, which had been French, but was in the process of transitioning into Spanish. Not only were they given provisions, clothes, weapons, tools, they were also given the right to settle the rich lands along the Bayou Teche, which was then considered to be the Atacapo territories, now generally known as the central part of Acadiana, the 22 parish area in South Central Louisiana. These exiles prospered on the Bayou Teche, again bonded with the local Chittimaca and other Indian tribes of the area, and developed very quickly a whole new culture, which they called themselves Acadians en Louisiane, or Nouvelle Acadie. Sadly, they had picked up some type of epidemic, probably on their stopover in the Caribbean, and many of their leaders were died within months of their arrival in the Bayou Teche area. But they carried on, and within one generation, they were prospering, primarily because of their ability to adapt to this new land, and also because of their experience with cattle. They were brought there because of the Dotrieve Cattle Compact, which promised them the ability to share crop existing cattle. But once they arrived there, they realized there was such a plentiful amount of wild cattle, they did not need to share crop, and they just started capturing their own cattle and having their own plantations developed, primarily based on that. The first Acadian governor was Governor Alexandre Mouton, whose father was considered the settler of the town of Lafayette. It's interesting to me that growing up watching cowboy movies, I was brought up on the Chisholm Trail and Roy Rogers stories. What I didn't know was my ancestors were driving cattle a century before the cowboys in Texas were driving cattle to Wichita. Our people were driving their herds of cattle to market across the Atchafalaya Swamp to the city of New Orleans that was in desperate need of meat. Now we will quickly go through some pen and ink sketches primarily derived from Shane Bernard's book and also the Center for Louisiana Studies, which will give you some semblance of the area where these Acadians settled in the 1800s. The Civil War was a great disruption, and although most of the Acadians had not acquired sufficient wealth to own plantations, many were conscripted to join the Southern cause. And we see a series of degrading news articles from Harper's Weekly, the most popular magazine in the country, demeaning the Acadians as showing him as a deserter because he had to be chained to a tree. Otherwise, he'd walk home to take care of his family. He didn't have a dog in that fight. There were many battles. There were two primarily large battles around uh, Grand Coteau. Uh, Lafayette had two major battles. The troops stormed on the General Banks on two different occasions, and they seized the St. John's Catholic Church as the Northern troops headquarters during the Civil War. Many of the women were able to uh, provide additional subsistence for the families, developing extreme good textile skills while using the cotton. Here's another demeaning picture of Acadian women washing clothes, but the person who wrote the article and the author who 
published this, was trying to show the Acadian women as low-class sluts. You would never depict a woman during this period showing breast line or legs spread, but that's the way they considered Acadians as though a people not welcome in their own lands because they had been deported here, they had a different religion, and they were viewed as strangers. We know that the Acadians in the 1930s, the next series of pictures will be from that period. That's extremely important because it was in 1930, about a century and a half after the deportation, that Cajuns of Louisiana went back for the first time to Nova Scotia, led by Senator Dudley J. LeBlanc, a 17-day train trip, which was an incredible testament for the reunification of Acadians from all over the world. And that led to a reunification during the World Acadian Congress, which we now experience every five years, and that was commenced in 1994. We see Acadians continued to have large families when they settled in South Louisiana as they had in Canada. Again, the textiles were purchased from women throughout the United States. Thankfully, the family on Avery Island that developed the Tabasco sauce, when they would ship Tabasco to New England, they would also ship blankets that women would order from the Cajun women throughout Acadiana. These textiles are highly valued today. Sugarcane was an extremely important crop after the cotton industry was devastated by the boll weevil. One of the things that kept the culture alive, even though it was prohibited to speak French in the schools from 1916 until finally Codafield got the laws reversed in 1968 when it was created, was the music. The music was kept alive in private homes, in dances, and that's how a lot of the culture was passed down and the culture kept alive. World War II was another game changer. It was the first time many Cajuns, such as my father, Henry Perrin, was drafted, never left home until the war. But when he came back, he was imbued with a renewed spirit of pride because he had seen how it was very, very valuable to be able to speak French and English. And he, like many of the Cajuns, were used as interpreters. So when they returned, they saw that people like me, a baby boomer born in 1947, got a good education, but they emphasized speaking English and not only speaking French. And the popularity of the culture was spread and the pride in the people knew no bounds, led by people like Jimmy DiMaggio, the first president of Codafield, shown here next to Judge Alan Babineau, who was also one of the epic leaders during this period, unraveling here for the first time the Acadian flag, which was designated by the Louisiana legislature, the state Acadian flag for the region of Acadiana in 1974. It is flown with great pride throughout the region, the state, and indeed the world today, signifying the pride of the Acadian people who conquered all obstacles and look forward to their next World Acadian Reunion, which will take place in the year 2024 in the birthplace of the first Acadian village, southwestern Nova Scotia, in the region north of Yarmouth, in the Argyle and Clare municipalities. Thanks to Shane Bernard, who allowed us to use many of the images from his book, Cajuns and Their Acadian Ancestors. <laughs>